Mr. Tribbiani, I'm afraid you've got kidney stones. Uh, well, what else could it be? It's kidney stones. <laughs> Around 1 in 10 Americans will have a kidney stone at some point in their lives. This prevalence has led to a lot of myths and misconceptions around kidney stones, what causes them, and what prevents them. Welcome to the Merck Manual's Medical Myths Podcast, where we set the record straight on today's most talked about medical topics and questions. I'm your host, Joe McIntyre, and on this episode, we're joined by Dr. Glenn Preminger, a professor of urologic surgery and director of the Duke Comprehensive Kidney Stone Center at Duke University Hospital. He's with us to debunk common myths surrounding kidney stones and answer questions to help you or someone you know lead a healthier life. Dr. Preminger, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great. Now, uh, I want to start with a, you know, first a general question. Can you tell our listeners what exactly a kidney stone is and how they develop? So kidney stones are actually an accumulation of uh, stone-forming salts within the urine, usually uh, made of calcium-containing stones like calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. And these small uh, crystals will, can come together to form a stone um, that can either sit around in the kidney or, or pass out by themselves. Now, how big are kidney stones traditionally? Are some smaller than others, some bigger than others? No question that stones can vary in size uh, and they also vary in composition. What dictates the size of the stone is, is that most stones, when they start growing, they're attached to the wall of the inside of the kidney. Uh, and at some point that attachment uh, dissolves and the stone then is floating free within the kidney. And if it stays up there, it can continue to grow. Now, some people who suffer from kidney stones can say it feels like a super painful stomach ache. Others may feel differently. How do you tell whether the pain you're feeling or discomfort is from a kidney stone or something else? Most of my patients, especially my female patients, tell me it feels uh, worse than childbirth, which uh, sounds more than a painful stomach ache. <laughs> um, and, and really, the discomfort that accompanies a kidney stone is determined by the acuteness or the suddenness of the obstruction that's caused by the stone. So it's usually a small stone that's been floating around in the kidney that falls from the kidney into the kidney tube or the ureter that causes an acute blockage that can cause severe colic, which is accompanied by nausea and vomiting and essentially intractable pain. Whereas you can have a, a larger stone that's growing for months and months within inside the kidney that's not causing any obstruction can grow undetected without any discomfort at all. Now, you mentioned women relating their pain to childbirth. Do only women suffer from kidney stones or um, is it both men and women? So it is both men and women. One myth, though, about the men and women is that for many years, men had a three times higher incidence of forming kidney stones than women. However, due to changes in diet and lifestyle uh, in the United States and across the world, we now see that the incidence of kidney stones in women is virtually identical to that of men. So it's basically equal between the two genders. Got it. Uh, if my parents, let's say, suffer from kidney stones or one of my parents suffer from kidney stones, am I more susceptible to them myself? Uh, no question, Joe. The patients uh, whose have uh, first line family members, either parents or siblings or aunts and uncles actually have an increased risk of making stones, but it's it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, definite uh, prediction that if your parents make a stone, you'll you'll form a stone. It, it does put you at higher risk, however. We have heard plenty of uh, rumors, whether true or not, you'll tell us, like uh, soda and tea can cause kidney stones. Are, is that actually true? What foods do and maybe do not cause kidney stones or are likely to cause kidney stones? Well, Joe, it really depends on, on the patient and what their particular metabolic issues are. Uh, certain, uh, certain foods, uh, specifically calcium and foods uh, that contain a large amount of oxalate like spinach or nuts, can potentially increase the risk of stones, but it really depends on how well the kidney handles those, uh, those constituents. For example, if uh, some people who eat a lot of dairy 
uh, as part of their diet with a lot of calcium, um, that that calcium gets taken up into the bone. And therefore, if it's not coming out in the urine, it's it's not causing a risk for stones. So it really depends on the individual. Um, and once we have a better idea of what the metabolic risk factors are in a particular patient, we can make specific dietary recommendations. Yeah, when it comes to those dietary recommendations, are there generally foods to uh, to avoid uh, or reduce your intake of if you have suffered or are likely to suffer from kidney stones? So I think that the two major food groups that we uh, discuss are dairy products uh, with calcium and the bottom line is that for the vast majority of people, we're recommending a normal dairy intake. And what we're talking about here is two to three dairy servings per day, with a dairy serving being a glass of milk, a couple slices of cheese, uh, a small yogurt, or a scoop of ice cream. Um, uh, and to avoid an excessive uh, amount of foods that have a high amount of oxalate, such as spinach or rhubarb or nuts. Now, we're not saying that you have to completely eliminate these foods from your diet, but again, like most other things uh, that are diet related, it's all about moderation. I think another major uh, myth is, is what you should drink. Um, and truthfully, it's, it's not necessarily what you should drink, it's how much you should drink. We want to keep the kidneys flushed out. And so we therefore encourage our patients to drink anywhere from 80 to 100 ounces of fluid per day. And for the majority of my patients, I'm not as concerned about what they drink as about how much they drink. And there's no doubt that water is the cheapest. It's the probably easiest and the, the easiest fluid to drink. Uh, but if people don't like water, they could they can make a homemade mixture of lemonade, or they could put a, a mix into their water. But juice and soda and other types of fluids, again, in moderation, are very reasonable. Now, our kidney stones, we've heard this rumor a little bit, are kidney stones more common in summer and in hotter climates, or is that not actually true? Well, uh, it is partly true in that the fact that we do see a fair amount of uh, stones uh, in during the summertime. However, remember that um, while it makes sense that if you're dehydrated because of the heat or the humidity, uh, that uh, you might make more stones because the urine becomes more concentrated with regards to the stone forming salts, that stones take months, if not years to form. And so if you pass a stone in July where, when it's hot, um, that stone was growing way back in January or even the, the summer before. So um, uh, I don't think uh, that we can attribute heat or humidity to active stone events, but no doubt it, they contribute to stone growth. Now, let's say someone has had kidney stones in the past and they, fortunately for them, had just passed one. Uh, is that the end of their kidney stone experience, or are they uh, more or less likely to get another kidney stone later in life? So, Joe, what we find is that once you uh, form one stone, uh, you are at increased risk for forming additional stones, and it's estimated that um, you have about a 50 to 80 percent chance of passing another stone within five to ten years. So, uh, if someone has formed a stone, at the very least, I would uh, ask them or suggest that they contact their either their primary care doctor, uh, their urologist, and, and to ask for some general recommendations about what you can do to minimize the risk of having another stone. But other things can increase the risk for stones. As we've discussed before, um, uh, family history can increase your risk for stones. Uh, the type of stone that you might pass can increase increase the risk uh, for having additional stones. And other um, medical issues like intestinal problems, inflammatory bowel disease, or perhaps some bone issues can also increase your risk for stones. So what we normally do is gauge the patient's risk factors for recurrent stone formation, and then we can make specific recommendations about how they can minimize 
their chance of having another stone. Dr. Preminger, you mentioned uh, a little while ago that um, kidney stones, you know, form in the kidney, obviously, uh, and they can become detached and float around, I think you said, uh, in the kidney. Is it possible for a kidney stone to form in the kidney and not detach and essentially stay there for years or months or whatever it is on end? No, no, no question, Joe. Uh, I see a lot of patients in my practice uh, who have had multiple stones in the past. We perform a uh, evaluation and determine their underlying risk factors for stones and we get them started on treatment. Uh, many of these patients will have small stones that remain up in the kidney and in some cases even big stones. Uh, but the stones tend to stay up in the kidneys and as long as they don't detach, as you mentioned, they should not cause any issues. But the things we're looking for are significant discomfort, infection, or evidence of obstruction of the stone. Those would be reasons that we'd want to remove stones. But just because the stone is sitting up in the kidney not causing any problems doesn't mean that it needs to be removed. Is it possible that a kidney stone, uh, once it's causing pain and I guess ready to to want to come out, uh, can be too big to pass naturally through urination? And if that's the case, uh, what happens then? So uh, really, the the determinants of whether a stone passes spontaneously enough are really the size and the uh, kind of configuration of the stone, if you will. The kidney tube or the ureter. Um, will usually accept or pass stones that are about five millimeters in, in length or less. Uh, and once you get to five or six millimeters, that the chance of spontaneous stone passage starts to go down dramatically. So if I see a patient with a one or two millimeter stone, uh, they have a 98 to 99% chance of passing that stone. Whereas if the stone is seven or eight millimeters, uh, that chance of spontaneous passage is closer to 20%. Now, I've seen patients pass stones that are 10 millimeters uh, in diameter. We usually provide them with some medication that helps to relax the ureter and with some uh, pain medication to minimize the discomfort. Uh, and we can see patients pass stones because we always find that mother nature does a better job than we do in, in, in having a stone come out. So, uh, but uh, no doubt that the larger the stone, if it gets hung up or if it's causing significant problems for the patient, we have uh, minimally invasive tools, usually telescopes that we can place into the kidney or to the kidney tube to fragment and remove the stones with minimal discomfort for the patient. Finally, if our listeners want to go somewhere for more information or are looking for resources about kidney stones or are even concerned that they may have one, where should they go? Sure. So there's no doubt that resources like the Merck Manual are excellent for uh, more information about kidney stones. I'll also reference the American Urological Association, uh, which is a our uh, kind of governing body for urologists. Uh, who have come out with very specific guidelines on both the medical and the surgical management of kidney stones. Uh, they also have information for patients uh, based on kidney stone management, and that would be at the auanet.org, um, would be a, a very valuable resource. Well, Dr. Preminger, thank you so much uh, for your time and expertise here. Uh, it was a really, really enlightening conversation uh, about kidney stones. And uh, for those of us, myself included, who uh, who deal with kidney stones regularly, this is a, a even more helpful. So for anyone who's listening, uh, for more information on these and hundreds of other medical topics, our listeners can visit MerckManuals.com. And Dr. Preminger, I'm going to let you leave our listeners with what we always do with the Merck Manuals. Thank you, Joe. It was certainly my pleasure to be here. As you know, medical knowledge is power. Pass it on. <laughs>